Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today's webinar is not focused on the rule of law. It's not focused on the constitution, contracts, or insolvency. It is not about the law at all, but rather the issue of remaining well in our practice of the law. My name is Mary DeGilio. I'm the managing partner of Swab Attorneys, the Sydney-based firm for Meritas. I'm also a director and Swab is a signatory of the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation. When listening to this webinar, I ask each of you to open up your mind Take off your lawyer hat and reveal the human being beneath. The son, the daughter, the brother, sister, mother, father, aunt or uncle, friend, neighbour or colleague that you are. The legal profession faces many challenges in a world of fast growing digitisation and disruption. In all of our planning to adapt to the evolving legal market, I encourage you not to lose focus on the people around you, the people in your space in the office, the person who you've looked at and wondered, is he or she okay? Martelli, McKegg, McDonald's, Magwix, Sneddon Hall and Gallup, Williams and Hughes and Swab Attorneys, if nothing else, after today, go and pay that person a visit and ask them if they're okay. Before I proceed, I'd like to thank my executive assistant, Alison Parry, and Amy Knight of Williams and Hughes, who have assisted me in preparing for this webinar. In the case of Alison, her assistance in weaving the work of the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation into our firm is continual together with our HR manager, Branka Matura, and our TJMS champions, James Skelton and Daniel Kenwell. Our agenda for this webinar session is to address four components. The first is courting the blues. Attitudes toward depression in Australian law students and lawyers. The survey and statistics into depression in the legal profession. The second is to talk to you briefly about the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation and the best practice guidelines for the legal profession. The third is to talk to you about the Wellness Doctrines, a recently launched book by a young lawyer, Jerome Dorasami. And the fourth is to briefly talk to you about um, Swab's commitment to wellbeing and share some of our stories and the impact across our firm. I would like to ask you to provide Amy and myself with some useful data. If you could use the chat um, box on the left-hand panel of your screen to let us know if you've ever heard of the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation and if you've heard of it, whether your firm is a signatory. The Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation was created in memory of Tristan Jepson a former University of New South Wales law student, a young lawyer and a comedian. Tristan suffered from severe clinical depression and he took his own life just four weeks after his 26th birthday in 2004. Tristan's death came as an incredible shock to his family and friends. Few knew of his ongoing battle with depression. At a gathering some of some of his friends after the funeral, a recurrent theme emerged. Some of the young women's boyfriends who also suffered from depression had been sworn to secrecy. Their boyfriends would not seek help. Tristan's parents, George and Mari, then decided to speak out about their son's death and his battle with depression against the norm of pretending that we ought not to mention his illness or the fact that he had taken his own life. The foundation exists in memory of Tristan's love of life, his passion for the law and social justice, his wonderful sense of humour and his love for and loyalty to family and friends. 
The Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation and the Brain and Mind Research Institute conducted a national study to examine the actual incidence of depression in the legal profession in Australia and evaluated mental health literacy interventions targeted specifically towards the profession. The study was titled Courting the Blues, Attitudes Towards Depression in Australian Law Students and Lawyers, and it was published in 2009. The study surveyed 2,413 lawyers. Those surveyed included 738 law students, 924 solicitors and 751 barristers. The study found that the level of psychological distress was high in all three groups compared to the general population. You'll see on your screen now some, some of those statistics. Of the lawyers surveyed, and remember there were 924 solicitors in that group. 36.4% of those solicitors reported that they have no or low psychological distress. But 31.6%, that's more, that's a third, reported that they had moderate distress. 22.3%, which is more than one fifth, reported that they have high distress. And almost 9% reported that they have experienced very high distress, as opposed to a general population, which reported about 4%. On the next screen, some information about law students. For many of our firms, uh, law students are very much the future as we take on graduates in our recruitment programs, um, it's useful to keep in mind these statistics. Of the law students surveyed, and there were nine, 738 law students surveyed, 35.1% reported low or no psychological distress. 33.3% reported moderate distress. 21.9% reported high distress and 13.3% reported very high psychological distress against a population of about 3%, general population of 3%. More concerning than the statistic of, experience psychological of experiencing psychological distress is the view on seeking help. 37.6% of law students said they would not seek treatment if they were experiencing depression. 31.3% of solicitors were of the same view and 21.6% of barristers. Over 50% of the participants in the survey thought that depressed people were likely to be discriminated against by their employer. This is where those of us who are partners and managers come into play. 50% of the participants, more than one half, thought depressed people were likely to be discriminated. This sends a very clear indication that in 2009, when the study was conducted, depression still had a stigma that created a fear of dealing with the issue openly. Eighteen point eight percent of the respondents who had sought help during the past year reported that there were active barriers to them seeking help. 37.1% of this group reported at least one barrier included not thinking anyone would help not knowing where to go for help, not being able to afford help, and asking for help, but not receiving it. Another one third of the group said that they preferred to manage their problem alone. In addition to these shocking statistics in relation to the employer attitude towards depression, are these statistics in relation to barriers to getting help. It is helpful to reflect on 
the comments made by some prominent individuals. Michelle Obama, First Lady of the United States of America. At the root of this dilemma is the way we view mental health. Whether an illness affects your leg or your brain, it's still an illness and there should be no distinction. John F. Graydon is the Executive Director of the University of Michigan Comprehensive Depression Center, the Rachel Upjohn Professor of Psychi Psychi Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences in the Department of Psychiatry and Research Professor in the Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience Institute. He says, we need so much more openness, transparency and understanding that it's okay to talk about depression as an illness. It's not a weakness. It's not a moral shortcoming. It's not something people brought on themselves. And Melissa, Mary Elizabeth Gall, former wife of the USA's former Vice President Al Gall, said, we all know that mental illness is not something that happens to other people. It touches us all. So I have hopefully given you some background and context to the issues of depression in the legal profession. It is very much an issue. Ignore it or not, it is there. I am sure some of us have been touched by depression in the law, whether through a colleague's experience or that of your own. For some of us, we will have lost a colleague who has chosen to take their own life as a result of a struggle with life as a depressed legal practitioner. The Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation objectives are best summed up in four points. Point one, to assist legal organisations to create workplaces that fulfil each of the psychological factors. I say psychological, they're currently referred to as psychosocial, um, but that is likely to change in the near future identified by extensive research as critical to psychological health. The second, intended for use by all within the legal profession. That includes students, sole practitioners, barristers, in-house counsel, practitioners within firms of all sizes, and the judiciary. Thirdly, intended to support those working within the profession to, array, to raise awareness of mental health issues. And fourthly, to understand and promote the initiatives and methods of management that create and maintain psychologically healthy and supportive workplaces. As mentioned previously, and evident by statistics, it is recognised that all legal workplaces are stressful. It has been shown that legal professionals are disproportionately at risk of suffering from psychological distress and illness. Workplace factors have been proven to contribute to the risk, causing harm to people's health and adverse impacts on the organisations that employ them. These factors extend to absenteeism, presenteeism, staff attrition, and work health and safety liability risks. The TJMF have developed 13 psychological factors which form a set of best practice guidelines for the legal profession. Whether or not you like to use the word psychological, whether or not you have a lived experience, either yourself or with a family member, friend, colleague, depression is in the law. It is alive and well. The TJMF Best Practice Guidelines were launched just over one year ago after nine years of hard work and commitment by Tristan's parents and some prominent and not so prominent personalities in the law. Since launching the TJMF Best Practice Guidelines, over 120 firms, legal teams in organisations, government bodies, bar associations and law councils have signed up to the guidelines. I will briefly outline the 13 psychological factors. Psychological factor one, organisational culture. 
This psychological factor focuses on creating a work environment that is characterised by trust, honesty and fairness. All people in the workplace are held accountable for their actions. People at work show sincere respect for others, for their ideas, for their values and beliefs. Difficult situations are addressed effectively. No ostrich heads in sand. Staff feel that they are part of a community and staff and management trust one another. Key words out of that psychological factor number one, accountability, respect, trust and communication. Psychological factor number two, that's psychological and social support. A work environment where co-workers and supervisors are supportive of employees' psychological and mental health concerns and respond appropriately as needed. The ideal organisation offers services or benefits that address employees' psychological and mental health. The staff feel part of a community. Their work, that they, the people are working with helpful and fulfilling their job requirements. But the organisation has a process in place to intervene if an employee looks distressed while at work. I think it's fair to say that in years gone by, as a profession, our response to that particular circumstance would be to put our head in the sand. This psychological factor is very much trying to confront, asking people if they're okay and offering them help openly and honestly. To have staff feel supported by the organisation when they are dealing with a personal or family issue. Supporting employees who are returning to work after time off due to a mental health condition and having people in the organisation having a good understanding of the importance of employee mental health. Psychological factor three is clear leadership and expectations. A work environment where there is effective leadership and support that helps employees know what they need to know, how their work contributes to the organisation and whether there are impending changes. To create in people's jobs that employees know what is, inspect, what is expected from them, that leadership in the workplace is effective, that staff are informed about important changes at work in a timely manner. Supervisors provide helpful feedback to employees on their expected and actual performance. And perhaps if we don't leave this to the annual performance review, but rather have more regular conversations with our people throughout the year. And then just an overall clear and effective communication across the firm. So for my co-managing partners who might be online, we shall not estimate the impact of our leadership style on the well-being of those in our firms. One of the most confronting experiences for me was when I attended my first TJMS lecture last year just before we became a signatory. And there were approximately 250 people attending the lecture. After the lecture I started to ask some questions about who made up the audience where the foundation received its support and I was embarrassed to find out that the majority of people in the audience were in fact law students, that legal private practice firms were well underrepresented and that there was no one firm that provided continual financial support to the existence of the foundation. I'm pleased to say that's not the case anymore. Psychological factor four, civility and respect. This is about creating a work environment where employees are respectful. When I talk about employees, I also include partners. This is about respect, upward, down and downward, up. Respect and considerate in their interactions with one another as well as with their clients, customers and the public. 
treating people with respect is something you should not really have to think twice about. There are plenty of, of examples um, in the legal profession where partners, managers and solicitors forget the basic value of respect. This is to encourage organisation to effectively handle conflicts between stakeholders, whether they're staff, customers, clients, public, suppliers. Again, take your head out from the sand. It's about people from all different backgrounds being treated fairly and ensuring that the organisation has effective ways of addressing inappropriate behaviour by customers, by clients, by employees and by partners. Psychological factor five is about psychological competencies and requirements. Creating a work environment where there is a good fit between employees' interpersonal and emotional competencies and the requirements of the position they hold. The organisation should consider existing work systems and allow for work redesign. The organisation should assess employee demand and job control issues such as physical and psychological job demands. Assess the level of job control and autonomy afforded to its employees. Monitor the management system to address behaviours that impact on employees and workplace. Value employee input, particularly during periods of change and the execution of work. Monitor the level of emphasis on production issues. Review its management accountability system and deal with performance issues and how staff can report errors. Emphasise recruitment, training and promotion practices that aim for the highest level of interpersonal competencies. This can be challenging because it requires us to reconsider the way we manage our organisation. However, if we don't drive change as leaders, it will be driven out of us by the millennium generation. For the young lawyers being recruited today, well-being and the firm's approach to managing well-being is high on the agenda. Psychological factor six, growth and development. A work environment where employees receive encouragement and support in the development of their interpersonal, emotional and job skills. People receive feedback at work that helps them grow and develop. Supervisors are open to employee ideas for taking on new opportunities and challenges. People have opportunities to advance within their organisation and the organisation values employees' ongoing growth and development. Psychological factor seven, reward and recognition. A work environment where there is appropriate acknowledgement and appreciation of employees' efforts in a fair and timely manner. Immediate supervision demonstrates appreciation of employees' contributions. I'm just gonna stop there and say that one of the common themes that comes through in research is the disconnect between junior lawyers and their supervising partners and the almost fear that it is instilled in some junior lawyers to approach supervising partners about work, questions, style, etc. Again, a message for those partners online. Paying people fairly for the work that they do, appreciating efforts made by employees, celebrating shared accomplishments, and valuing employees' commitment and passion for their work. Psychological factor eight. A work environment where employees are included in discussions about how their work is done and how important decisions are made. For us as an ANZ region, and this issue I'm sure will be um, discussed with rigor next week when we have our regional conference, we are very much in an industry that is being disrupted. We can choose to disrupt or we can choose to be disrupted. And part of this is embracing the involvement and influence of staff with new ideas and innovation. 
staff should feel free to be able to talk to their immediate supervisor about how their work is done, about how their work is organised, be free to have opinions and suggestions. People should be informed about important change that can impact how their work is done and the organisation should encourage input from all staff on important decisions related to work. Psychological factor nine, one that's been around for a long time in our industry and is a challenge for all firms and that is workload management. Trying to create an environment where tasks and responsibilities can be accomplished successfully within the available time. The amount of work that we expect from our employees needs to be reasonable for the positions they hold. We need to equip our people with equipment and resources. They need to do their job well. Staff should feel free to talk to their supervisors about the amount of work they have to do. In a world where we're constantly trying to develop business, create precedents, better our systems, we need to ensure that our people are given sufficient free time to work without disruption or interruption. And staff should have an appropriate level of control over prioritising their tasks and responsibilities when facing multiple demands. Psychological factor 10, engagement. A work environment where employees feel connected to their work and are motivated to do their job well. I'm sure there is nobody on the line that wouldn't want this for their firm. We want people to enjoy coming to work. Encourage people to be willing to give extra effort at work if needed. Describe work as an important part of who they are. Having staff committed to the success of the organisation and people being proud of the work they do. Psychological factor 11 is about balance. Balance is an interesting word. We hear work-life balance used a lot. Perhaps balance is not the best choice of words. Last week at the annual TJMF lecture, Alex Malley, who is the CEO of um, CPA, Certified Practicing Accountants Australia, was the guest speaker. And he talked about work-life balance being a very personal thing. And that is not so much um, that you need to have a balance between work and life, i.e. 50% of your time at work, 50% of your time at home, but you need to create a harmony that works for you in your life that makes you happy. We need organisations to encourage people to take their entitled breaks. Staff are to be able to be re to be able to meet demands reasonably. Organisations should promote, promote work-life harmony. Staff feel free to talk to their supervisors when they're having trouble maintaining harmony between their life and work. And we want people to have energy left at the end of the day. Psychological factor 12, this is about psychological protection, creating a work environment where management takes appropriate action to protect employees' psychological safety. Encouraging organisations to be committed to minimising unnecessary stress at work. Having managers and supervisors care about employees' emotional wellbeing. Organisation taking and making efforts to prevent harm to employees from harassment, bullying, discrimination, violence and stigma. And people wanting and feeling free to describe their workplace as being psychologically healthy. And the final psychological factor, factor 13, is protection of physical safety. Creating a work environment where management takes appropriate action to protect the physical safety of employees. People feeling safe, not concerned or anxious about the physical work environment. They can work in a way where their schedule allows for reasonable breaks. All health and safety concerns are taken seriously. Staff asked to do work that they believe is unsafe, have no hesitation in refusing to do it. People get sufficient training to perform their work safely. And the firm or organisation assess psychological demands of the jobs and the job environment to determine if it presents a hazard to people's health and safety.
that's the 13 best practice guidelines for the legal depression for the legal profession the guidelines are a voluntary framework signatories to the TJMF are encouraged to implement the guidelines at their own pace and tailor them to suit their own workplace they are best practice there's no suggestion that every firm is going to be able to, to achieve all of those guidelines in any short period of time. The guidelines encourage ongoing improvement. Over time, we at TJMF are hopeful that the guidelines will assist cultural change and a change of attitude, particularly at the leadership level. The structure, policies and process for legal organisations will change to match the new attitude and culture. By becoming a signatory to the guidelines, legal organisations are demonstrating that they as leaders are leaders in the profession and that they are committed to putting psychological safety at the heart of their culture and the forefront of their minds. I now wanted to briefly talk to you about the wellness doctrines. The Wellness Doctrines is a book that was launched last month. It's written by 27-year-old lawyer Jerome Dorosami. Jerome has suffered from severe clinical depression. He chose to write a book of his stories and provide a toolkit to help the profession. Jerome is an inspiring young man with a huge amount of courage. The book examines the prevalence, causes and effects of psychological distress, anxiety and depression for law students and young lawyers in Australia in a manner that we've never seen before. The book includes first-hand accounts and case studies of over 45 legal professionals and health experts. Julian Burnside, Australian barrister and human rights advocate, said of the book, if enough lawyer, young lawyers have the courage to say, I'm depressed, I need help, they will make a more effective generation of lawyers. Justice Shane Marshall, Jerome deserves the appreciation of all law students and junior lawyers for his considerable contribution to the discuss discussion about mental well-being in the study and practice of law. His new book provides very helpful and practical guidance to law students and young lawyers on how to safeguard and care for their mental health. The Honourable Keith Mason, ACQC, former President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. He said, this is an insightful and practical guide addressing a vital issue for our time. The personal storage, stories will both encourage and warn. Dr Rachel Field, Coordinator of Australian Wellness for Law Network and Associate Professor in Law at Queensland University of Technology said, the student and graduate voice is critical in the success of the movement to address the high levels of psychological distress that we know Australian law students are experiencing. As a founder of the Wellness Network for Law, I am heartened by the contribution to this movement that the Well Doctrines makes. Dr Robert Fisher, Head of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychological Services at St Vincent's Clinic and Private Hospital in Sydney, is a co-director on the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation Board. Dr Fisher said, when people have been severely depressed, they talk about physical and psychological pain that they experience. They report being profoundly unhappy lacking energy, lacking drive and motivation, not being able to sleep, being highly agitated or anxious. They may contemplate suicide and feel very isolated, as though no one really understands what they're going through. They often feel that they're a burden on others and that everyone would be better off, including themselves, if they were dead. When I read that quote, or when I read that quote, I found that quite confronting. I found myself in, in a place where initially I couldn't relate to the words on the page, um, that there was possibly a place in life where I would feel so isolated um, that, the, that I would feel that it would be better off for everybody else if I were dead. But reading the book 
talking to Dr. Fisher about that quote and the experiences of people who suffer depression has made me understand that for a lot of our profession, about one third, this is a real and common feeling, something we can't ignore. The next slide, which I won't read, is worth a read um, for you personally when, you, when we get off the webinar. This is about proactivity against reactivity. And it's an article about, uh, about Jerome's view. He was concerned that people would think about his book. They don't need the book. They're perfectly healthy and happy. And that depression is something that only happens to other people. Uh, thankfully, uh, the response to Jerome's book has been um, uh, unexpected in his, uh, in his own words and quite overwhelming. Um, so I encourage uh, any of you who've not um, read the book or not had access to the book to do so and I'm quite happy to um, provide you with direct details of how you can uh, purchase a copy of the book. Um, we at Swab purchased a copy of the book for all of the lawyers within our practice um, and that was received um, uh, very positively by our people and we have organised for Jerome to come into the firm and to talk to our young lawyers um, in February next year. So hopefully you haven't found all of that uh, particularly depressing um, but it is important that we as leaders and managers and participants in legal firms understand the prevalence of depression and anxiety in our workplace. Uh, when we decided to become a signatory to the TJMF guidelines um, over a year ago, it was largely because there was uh, a real connection between what the foundation was doing and what we were trying to do as a firm and we felt that signing up would really help bolster um, and endorse some of the initiatives that, uh, that we had implemented. I will just now quickly before we wrap up um, share with you some of our firm's commitment to wellbeing and some of the things that we have um, initiated over the last year. Uh, the first um, is an EAP program. Um, regrettably, our firm did not have an EAP program in place until about two years ago. Um, that's an employee assist program. This is now available for a very, very modest cost to the firm, available to all of our staff and their immediate family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That is um, psychological assistance um, by phone or face-to-face, -face, completely anonymous. Um, and uh, has been well welcomed by, um, by the people within our firm. Uh, the second is the Unlock Your Potential program, which was an initiative of our HR manager, uh, Branka. Uh, this was a program that had nothing to do with being a lawyer or working in a law firm. It was a program that was tailor-made for our people um, from senior associate down to um, uh, shared services. Uh, so effectively everybody in the firm accepting partners were invited to participate in the Unlock Your Potential program which was a program that ran for six months with an external coach um, encouraging our people to unlock their own personal potential, understand their strengths and weaknesses, their challenges um, in life uh, and give them a toolkit um, to try and work on some of the things that they found challenging or difficult um, in their journey of life. The third was uh, the Brain Dump and Share a Story initiative. One of the things I um, implemented when I became managing partner um, of SWAB just over 20 months ago was the Brain Dump, uh, which is an informal group of people across the firm with whom I have lunch once a quarter. Um, there's no agenda, there are no other partners um, that participate and I always open up the meeting by inviting those in the committee to tell me uh, what sucks about the firm um, and try and get some real insights about what's really going on in people's minds. 
I can't always address everything, um, but I can find um, ways to assist people that find some things challenging. Um, certainly have changed some firm behaviour as a result of the brain dump um, session and at least answer questions for people and perhaps give them some rationale as to why things happen the way they do. Um, and the most exciting thing about the brain dump um, is that some of the initiatives that I have implemented um, have come out of, that, um, out of that forum. And the share a story, which is another favourite one for me, is uh, at our monthly firm meeting, we always have uh, one person share their story, um, where they've come from, how they've ended up at SWAB, what they may have done beforehand. Um, this encourages us to really understand uh, our peers and uh, where they've come from, their own stories. We've completely changed the communication um, uh, style and forum in the firm. Um, so there is a lot more open communication um, and as I said we now have an all staff monthly firm meeting um, with some real strategic communication back to the firm about what is and has gone on. We created the SWA brand of service which is a set of behavioural um, expectations um, with respect to how we interact with our colleagues and we interact with our clients. Um, we also did a whole lot of branding around that and everybody has a mouse pad um, and a poster in their office or in their workspace reminding them about the SWAB brand of service. Uh, flexible working arrangements um, and being able to accommodate flexing work, flexible working arrangements um, of course always against uh, there being a mutual benefit um, to both the firm and uh, the person seeking those arrangements but being very clear about that from the outset. Um, we've had some training at a partner level about being more accessible and approachable. We have a fantastic active social committee um, who uh, plan family day, which we had a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, barefoot bowling for the family. They've got the SWAB soccer competition on Sunday um, and other various social events. Uh, comparatively to a lot of law firms in Sydney, we have a low billable hour expectation at six hours a day. Um, we take active steps to address situations that look unusual or patterns of concerning behaviour. And again, this has been a real shift for us. Um, you know, to be completely frank with you, probably previously we had a, a culture of perhaps putting our head in the sand and thinking that these issues were too hard and now we bring them to the surface and bring them to the surface very quickly. Um, Co-contribution for wellness initiatives. So as a firm, we share 50-50 costs with our staff for things such as gym memberships, yoga classes, um, and other general wellbeing initiatives. We encourage our lawyers to leave uh, work by 6.30 um, and we do get concerned about people who are here beyond that time for ongoing continual periods of time. So we ask the question, why? What's going on? Do you have enough support? Um, do we need to change the way things are working? Um, if you have to work long hours, are you able to leave work, go home, spend some time with your family and perhaps pick up later in the night? And we as a firm have um, uh, uh, support staff um, ratio that uh, is probably a little at odds with a lot of other firms. We're running at a ratio of three to one to ensure that our lawyers are getting sufficient support um, from their legal assistance. Um, the impact um, of the TJS guidelines on our firm, as I said, they really reinforced the value of initiatives that we had introduced and the change that we had embarked upon as a firm. They now influence the way um, I lead the firm and the partners lead the firm, how we behave, mentor, support our people and shape our firm. They provide a compelling minimum acceptable standard for firm behaviour as an employer. They've challenged us to ensure that mechanisms are in place to check in and make ourselves accountable for our influence. And we slip up, so we have to continually go back to the psychological factors and say, well, we've let that one get off the radar, we've got to pull back, we've got to rein this behaviour in. So they're a real um, valuable uh, checklist for the management team. 
um, and the partners in the way that we manage the firm. And they reflect uh, best practice guidelines um, and that's something that we aspire to all round for our clients and our people um, and for the um, profession um, at large. So that's the end of the formal um, uh, webinar. I'll now um, hand over to uh, my co-presenter, um, Amy Nice. The conference has been unmuted. Amy, are you there? Hello? Ah, uh, yes. Were there I think any you questions can... that you wanted me to address, Amy? Yes, sorry, my mic was off. Thanks for that, Mary. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I've been gathering. If you think that someone at the office is having a hard time um, and, and you're perhaps concerned about how they're handling things, how would you suggest that that be approached? Do you think, should each firm perhaps have a particular person that everybody can go and speak to if they've got concerns? Or do you think that it's something that you should approach directly with the person that you're concerned about? Um, I think it's very much a case-by-case -case, um, assessment. Uh, our HR manager certainly plays a very um, prominent role in um, intervening and um, our most common practice to date would be for people to approach her and then for her to um, approach the person. Um, mainly because she has all of the resources at her fingertips um, with respect to referring somebody on to the EAP quickly. Um, she also has the authority to say, look, you know, let's, let's get you in a cab, let's get you home, do you need to take leave? Um, but certainly, I think if you're in a situation where there is somebody in the office who um, works closely with you and you are concerned about them then and you have a relationship with that person, um, then it would be appropriate for you to uh, approach them. Um, the, the challenge is, um, of course, if somebody then confides in you, um, and you then can't break their confidence, otherwise um, you'll break that relationship. So um, you do have to consider how you deal with information that you might get from that conversation without breaking the trust of the person because that may very well be more detrimental than saying nothing at all. Great, thank you. Um, one of the comments that was made on the online forum is that um, people don't often say to you when you break a leg, oh you just need to get on with regular activities and you'll be fine. And yet for mental illness that is heard too often. Have you found since starting your relationship with the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation that mental illness is becoming more broadly recognised and accepted as an illness the same way that physical illnesses are? Yeah, look, um, the answer to that question, Amy, is um, overwhelmingly so. And uh, that's not just um, within our firm. Uh, there are 120 signatories to the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation guidelines now. And um, as an example, and I'm sure if there's anyone from McDonald's on the line, um, they'll be able to um, support me in this comment. At the recent Australian um, Law Awards in Sydney, um, I was pleasantly surprised with the number of people who received awards and made mention of the impact of the TJMF guidelines on uh, the way they were practicing um, practicing law and uh, the values and behaviours that they were encouraging in their firm. So I think we are worlds away from where we were a year ago. Um, we still have a long way to go and I think the biggest challenge is um, getting engagement at the appropriate level. So for example, um, I would be interested, although I'm not going to seek the information out, as to how many managing partners are on this webinar. Um, 
one of the constant struggles we have um, at TJMF is um, getting leaders, partners and managing partners to take responsibility for this issue. Um, our HR managers are obviously qualified uh, to deal with the issue much more so than, um, than we as lawyers. Um, but uh, lawyers also have a particular personality whereby they um, very much like often to hear messages from other lawyers. And um, the disappointing thing for the founder of uh, TJMF, uh, TJMF is the number of times she goes into a new firm um, having made an appointment to meet the managing partner and um, the managing partner says to her, uh, sorry, the HR manager turns up and says to her, I'm sorry, the managing partner had something that's just come up. Um, and her biggest challenge has been getting and retaining engagement um, at the partner level. So um, I encourage all of the Meritas firms to try and um, have engagement at the partner level and, and retain it at the partner level because it does make spreading the message um, and living those um, factors a lot easier for um, for our very competent and capable HR managers if they know they've got uh, the backing of the partners. Great. Thanks, Mary. Those were the two questions that I had. Thank you, okay. Mary, and thank you, Amy, for your um, for your work and your presentation today on the webinar, Leading Excellence webinar series. Um, thank you all for attending. The recording will be available on the Meritus.org website. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.